canción, Carlos Poveda. Let's hear Carlos Poveda now. Yes, thank you, and good afternoon. Also, within this framework, uh, I would first like to acknowledge uh, the International Balthazar Garzón Foundation for this invitation. It's almost a paradox to discuss universal jurisdiction, whereas uh, uh, citizenship is still not universal. Ecuadorians need a visa to come to Spain. People from other countries don't need it any longer, and yet we still do. But despite that fact, we're already here to uh, discuss these matters that are of relevance for uh, modern uh, states. I finally get to meet Mr. Vivanco. I know that he is mentioned a lot in our uh, president's speeches, and I'm beginning to understand why. Basically, I believe in universal jurisdiction. And as I heard the other speakers, I was thinking that back in the 80s and 90s, after Pinochet's trials, uh, Gar Judge Garzon's actions in favor of that, a transition did take place. And most Latin American countries wanted to come over to Spain and knock on the door of, the, of your courts of law to get our cases processed. Back at that time, I was a consultant for remedies. And uh, considering the inability at the time of processing those issues in a court of law, serious crimes against humanity, uh, an idea was launched, I launched it, that perhaps we could just come to the Spanish courts and file our cases here. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, the point uh, came up that we were a, a domestic court and we had to be given a chance to make this transition by ourselves. But obviously, uh, Ecuador has also gone through changes in its constitution. And one of the most interesting changes that took place after the new constitution approved in 2008, uh, we can... Uh, include that plurinational multicultural state. If we read the preamble of our constitution, it's just wonderful. And its vision is uh, similar to the constitution of Bolivia. In recognition of diversity, that uh, uh, where uh, the uh, legal aspect is not only an aspect for the resolution of, con of uh, conflict, but also for uh, better well-being. Uh, when dealing uh, with aspects of summa causa, uh, we need to consider the recovery of our ancient traditions and nationalities. And nature is actually acknowledged in our constitution as entitled to certain rights. And actually, there are crimes against nature that are described in our constitution. It also establishes a number of guarantees, uh, and uh, there is a new approach on crimes against humanity. And um, uh, we had plenty of support uh, from Spain in the drafting of our constitution. That's why I'm mentioning it. The problem of the validity of our constitution uh, is that it has many shining points, but also some dark points. And one of the discussions that is taking place in this field is that for the first time ever, the Ecuadorian constitution consecrated in Article 78 the rights of victims. And of course, the right to truth and uh, to a full remedy, which is a, a very generalistic support uh, for uh, uh, a legal uh, proceedings uh, code that uh, is belittled by this huge prob uh, problem. But having started a new period with a new president in 2007, the Truth Commission was also created. I must point out, however, that certain ingredients participated in this recipe. The situation in Ecuador differs from the one in Argentina, Chile, or even Peru. However, uh, they had gone through repression and oppression in the decade from uh, uh, 
84 to 88, when President Fabris uh, was in office, where several disappearances and executions took place. And the interesting thing about this Truth Commission is the fact that it was established uh, in batches. Uh, some of these batches went as far as 1988, but no further cases were uh, uh, accepted after that. The case of Emma Yuma, which is one of the first cases of defense of the rights of nature, that was not part of the uh, Truth Commission report because it might stain uh, the curriculum of President Correa. But this uh, commission was launched with 118 cases, nearly 456 victims. And I would say that one of the critical stages I could mention here is that within the Truth Commission, people who were being affected as victims were part of the commissions, were, were, were commission members. And, uh, well, the perpetrators were claiming that the commission was biased towards uh, certain positions that might uh, make it seem biased. But there was also a, a feeling that victims have been acknowledged. First rank and second rank victims. Well, first rank victims were, were groups that uh, back in the 80s had to go underground as subversive groups and which are uh, now having um, uh, functions within the regime and other victims that do not belong into that sphere. One might suppose that effects were different in uh, the legalization of their statuses. And I remember that when interviewing the victims of, the, uh, of these crimes, we had considered uh, several remedies, but nearly 95% of victims do not want remedy to be applied. They want justice. And once the report of the Truth Commission was published, well, it took about uh, two years to uh, bring all the cases to justice. And I myself brought the first uh, case to a uh, national court of law, because uh, in the past there was a, um, in criminal law. And it was very interesting and a novel approach in a situation of the implementation of international instruments, particularly the effective immediate implementation of these uh, provisions. One of our first difficulties was uh, with the indictment or uh, the allegation by perpetrators that uh, uh, these cases had already prescribed and were uh, no uh, longer uh, subject to trial. And some of these matters are still under debate in the Constitutional Court because, well, it's not like the Constitutional Court uh, has an optimum predisposition to work on these cases. They have their own political agenda that does not necessarily favor the victims. And under these circumstances, we started uh, bringing all these uh, cases to court. And I would say that one of the main hurdles was the lack of uh, training of uh, both judges and attorneys in very specific aspects contemplated in the legislation. And perhaps I have a criticism to make. I've been a trainer of uh, judges and attorneys. And precisely, uh, one of the matters discussed in that area was the validity of certain instruments. And many critics have been made to the resolutions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. As a matter of fact, our country did not comply with one resolution concerning three people that had filed a claim against the President of the Republic. And, well, it has its very special dynamics. These people went into Sarayara, which is indigenous territory, and the indigenous people of Sarayaku insisted on fulfilling the precautionary measures of the Inter-American Court, which uh, were opposed by the state that completely uh, trampled on uh, this ruling. So, when I'm preparing judges in these matters, uh, reality is different from the one you see in real life. And sometimes it goes uh, into, uh, sometimes it's easy to fall into apathy when you realize that the real world does not work as your ideal world. For the first time ever, and this is typical for Ecuador, the National Court of Justice stated 
that uh, the uh, inter-American court ruling was a violation of sovereignty. And also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had uh, their say in this, and so did the president. <coughs> so we have prepared, we have trained judges in the compliance of, his, of international instruments, and then this kind of thing happened. We've trained them in all international uh, instruments, but Ecuador uh, refused to comply with the Inter-American Court ruling. So we're preparing, we're training on one side, but on the other side we get this uh, uh, government message that uh, the ruling should not be complied with. So, well, in practice, and this is something Joaquin knows well, uh, 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 victims uh, tend to be worn out, first of all, because their cases in court require s highly specialized professionals dealing with these topics. And we don't have specialized uh, uh, professionals. Judges are broadly prepared on human rights, but there's very specific training missing. And, well, it, obviously we acknowledge the cooperation of Spanish experts when it came to creating a truth commission where uh, um, prosecutors were prepared for this kind of case. There is a rational concern about uh, a missing persons, about uh, the disappeared. But this truth commission in uh, the district attorney's office has been uh, taken apart or the division has been uh, removed and uh, um, prosecutors are finding it increasingly hard to participate in these cases. Another aspect I consider very important is the rigidity that uh, reality brings. Apparently, uh, uh, the uh, uh, burden of proof, etc., seems to uh, follow a very strict uh, uh, criteria particularly considering that we do have a system for uh, witness protection and victim protection and uh, members of the police force and law enforcement agencies are involved in these cases and yet the main source of uh, uh, or the main object of protection is uh, law enforcement agents. So when the police is supposed to protect both victims and perpetrators, no victim can feel secure. I do not feel secure just because a law enforcement agent is watching me. So here's an important question. Where does the burden of proof lie in these cases? So these are institutional structures. So if we have a chain of command, if we're dealing with organizational structure, obviously the burden of proof needs to lie on the institution with, whose members are uh, undergoing trial. So obviously if you're too rigorous, uh, you're getting uh, the uh, feared result, uh, which is uh, uh, basically uh, absolution uh, the absolution of perpetrators, which is perhaps a topic to discuss here. And so we're striving to get uh, uh, this process to become more flexible, considering that somebody uh, might criticize the reversal of the burden of proof, because the burden of proof right now is placed on victims. As a matter of fact, victims even have to pay certain expenses, which uh, uh, somehow keeps uh, prevents them from getting justice. Sometimes when we hear about remedy, people tend to think only money is involved. And yes, money is involved as part of the remedy, but a more important part of remedy is access to justice. Perhaps I will not be reimbursed for this or that uh, uh, damage, but at least I will have access to justice. So perhaps we should rethink uh, some of these uh, aspects. 
We also need to understand that we need a deeper analysis on the matter. Our Constitution provides excessive guarantees. We tend to think only about uh, the defendant and the accused, but not the victim. And uh, the definition of the United Nations on victim is not necessarily taken into account in most cases. People who are uh, suffer psychological damage are often forgotten. Or what happens to <coughs> the attorneys defending these cases? And, and on behalf of victims, which are not even ranked as victims. So perhaps we need to find a new balance between victim and defendant. I could tell you an anecdote. In one, in one case I had the uh, victim the, the mother of a 16-year-old who was executed by the police was told, or, or the, the defendant was told that he could cross-examine the mother, and uh, at that they said, we guarantee due process of the accused, so we have no question for uh, the victim's mother, or for the uh, kid's mother. They didn't even say the victim. So this shows a huge difference between victim and defendant. A defendant has a public defense. And obviously, they have full guarantees. But what do victims have? Do they have a public defendant, a public attorney? They don't. Not in my country. I hope they will someday. Sometimes they cannot even top up their cell phones, and yet they have to bear all that burden to just to be present at, uh, in a court of law, where results are not necessarily favorable. So I, I do value that despite uh, uh, negative uh, rulings, they always keep their uh, heads up because they trust that justice will be served. That's the hope we have in my department and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. That is why today international organizations, supranational courts of law in my country have such an important role to play because now we're also dealing with sovereignty. We didn't used to do that in the past. And when we hear about complying with the resolution of the Inter-American Resolution, which is not the same thing that happened in Colombia with uh, President Santos, uh, well, in Ecuador, the uh, decision was not adopted, was not complied with. And of course, there are aspects of freedom of expression. I'm sure you're perfectly familiar with uh, topics like these. And that's why when I hear Irene speaking about the media and democracy, it is important to start thinking what might happen if you're talking about democracy as an ethical reference, perhaps you need to, uh, to understand what a constitutional democracy is and what a referendum democracy is, which means that those in the majority are the ones who rule. <clears throat> but on behalf of the majority, uh, democracy is being crippled because a group has absolute control on everything. In my country, well, we're always innovating. So we have innovated and have created the Council for Citizens' Participation. It was officially created, but participation of citizens is hugely uh, a, a bureaucratic matter. So when there's citizens participation, participation is allowed only for those who agree with a certain line of thought. And that's a source of concern because we might say, oh, we do have citizens participation. But so, uh, actually that committee is in charge of uh, hand-picking uh, public officials. And we should even perhaps rethink our media, <coughs> as they might sometimes uh, hinder the uh, right to differ. 
At least in my countries, we have complicated situations that move us to rethink a lot of things. Since uh, um, I was thinking about uh, Estela, uh, was saying a while ago from Argentina, there is also an international cooperation among perpetrators. There is a, a network of support. Victims uh, trust international uh, personalities, but perpetrators have their own network of support. As a matter of fact, I found two uh, commissioners from Argentina supporting the thesis of the alleged perpetrators. And it, well, I, I uh, clearly saw that there was a, a support network for criminals. And the crime also becomes universal, just as jurisdiction. And these perpetrators already know how to evade um, universal justice. I know I'm three minutes overdue, but it is clear that we should also uh, think about plebiscite democracy or referendum democracy as an accumulator of um, constitution provisions. I might say that in our constitution we have uh, contemplated <coughs> the a crime of genocide, but genocide and ethnocide add uh, two new words, generalized and systematic practice. And that's a concern of ours because that is not the precise definition of ethnocide or genocide. And as a matter of fact, it has to be both things, generalized and systematic. So we need to prepare for things that might happen in the future. I'm just about to finish. And then there's uh, the aspect of the defense of nature. Not only, uh, or we need to start thinking about the rights of nature, particularly for uh, serious crimes like the alteration of biological processes or affecting the principles of evolution because we need to be aware that the action of man can actually uh, harm uh, communities in many different ways. In uh, my uh, country, uh, there are uh, communities organizing against the entrance or uh, or communities that are sieged or under siege by transnational companies in an attempt to get into their territory. So, or in wait of a situation to change in their favor. So, we need to think about the future ahead of us. And, of course, we need to consider uh, those uh, costs we've been discussing here, the cost of legal independence. Baltazar Garzon is not here, but I've heard him say, when somebody wins, somebody else loses. So there's this uh, huge unbalance in Latin America. And perhaps we uh, need to clearly understand that domestic courts in Peru, Argentina, etc., need to adopt this principle of universal justice that at some point you have proven so effective. And more than ever today, we need solidarity by reinforcing legal independence, which is not only a guarantee for judges and attorneys, but also for common citizens and for democracy. Thank you. Human rights. Uh, let me reformulate this, rephrase it. Legitimacy in original legitimacy in exercise, because this is a democratic government, but in their enforcement of laws, <coughs> citizens. I think this idea between uh, the difference between a uh, um, plebiscite based or a democracy uh, or uh, sorry or a basic democracy it is about respecting basic human rights it's about uh, respecting the independence of powers I think legitimacy can go any in any direction but this is also to be combined with democratic uh, uh, alternation, and that's our challenge. Maybe tomorrow we could call for a referendum to pass a death penalty in my country, and it, it would be passed, it would be approved. But that's 
that's our commitment, commitment towards life. And I think that the measure of democracy is based on this kind of decisions that governments might not like because it's complicated, it is uncomfortable, because clearly through this place beside based democracy, they can interfere in court, uh, courts of justice. And that's what I said, what are the, the challenges of universal justice? And unfortunately, I think there are plenty of colleagues, many of colleagues working in the field of human rights, some or are on this side, some others are on the other side, and they know how to do it because there is this armor situation. If I control the legislation, I control ideas such as universal jurisdiction, and I add additional prerequisites. So if I were to be prosecuted, there would be no justification. And so that's when we get a lot deception. And this is what happens uh, on a plebiscite based democracy. That's my opinion. We try and favor a direct democracy. That's what we wanted. We wanted to have a popular consultation on, um, on a natural reservation uh, that is uh, reserved, sorry, which is uh, unique. Because it, it, it is not about turning down votes or ballots because uh, the paper is scrapped or a scratch, but that's what some people understand as democracy. Then, the greatest challenge for democracies would be, and I agree with um, Miguel and uh, Irene and Juan, is this idea of respecting human rights anywhere we find ourselves in. This is the basic value, and that helps us live or not to live in a democracy. Thank you very much.